All right, well, I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. I'm Tracy Moldenhauer, and I am a mom in the RVA who is a home mender. And tonight we have Allison Riley, Carrie Lochterman, and Becky Bourne, who are going to be presenting on It's Okay to Make Mistakes, The Importance of a Growth Mindset. So I am so excited for this information, and I'm glad that you could join us tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to present our speakers. So welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Mrs. Logterman. For those of you uh, who haven't had the opportunity to meet me, or I haven't had your students, so welcome. We're so excited uh, to be here to share this topic that's near and dear to our hearts with you. So I'm going to share my screen here. Here we go. All right, we've been working hard to present to you. It's okay to make mistakes, the importance of that growth mindset. So I want to start with a couple of famous failures. And one being J.K. Rowling. You know her from the famous books. And how she failed many years ago, there was a woman named Jo who lived in Scotland. Jo loved to write. She got up every morning and found something to write about. After finishing her first story about a boy named Harry Potter, she wanted to share it with the world. Jo took her book to the best publishers across England. All of them rejected her novel. So how did she overcome that? She didn't give up. She asked her agent to keep trying because she was confident in the story she had written. Even though she sometimes felt confused by the rejection, she pushed forward. After a year of trying, a publisher in London finally accepted her story, and she published her novel under the name J.K. Rowling. She finally got to see her novel in stores and in children's hands. She wrote a whole series of books about Harry Potter. Because J.K. Rowling believed in herself, she never gave up. And just think if we didn't have those books now. What an amazing story. And another lead in is Milton Hershey. And you can only imagine by the name, what if we didn't have his product? So how did he fail? Milton Hershey grew up in the countryside. The land was beautiful and he had a loving family. Although they were happy, the Hershey's were also very poor. So when he was still a young boy, Milton had to leave school to find a job. He searched and searched, but could not find a job he liked. How did he overcome his failures and succeed? After being fired from his latest jobs, job as a printer, Milton felt down hearted. He was worried about money and his family, but being fired was ultimately for the best. His mother and aunt encouraged him to learn how to make candy. He liked the idea a lot, so Milton spent years learning about sugar and chocolates, my favorite, and all sorts of sweets. Eventually, he created the Hershey Company, one of the most successful candy companies in the world. What would happen without Hershey bars? Oh my goodness. I'm afraid Halloween wouldn't quite be the same. Hold on just a second here. All right. And so I share those stories with all of you because they failed and made mistakes time and time and time again. And that's what we are here to share with you tonight. What is a growth mindset? And what isn't a growth mindset? And how we can help kids in education and in life um, really grab on to the growth mindset. Um, so first off, I'm gonna share with you fixed versus growth mindset. And a fixed mindset, you may 
think of the phrase, many of you I'm sure have heard it, this is what I'm born with, so I just have to deal with it. The talents, someone with a fixed mindset really in their mind believe the talents, abilities, and intelligence will never change or they're just, they stay, they will always stay the same, they're fixed. That these traits are responsible for their successes and mistakes are seen as failures instead of an opportunity to grow and learn. A lot of times people with a fixed mindset, I would say they fear new experiences, they avoid risks, definitely, feel the need um, to prove themselves to others, to quit. They often quit or give up before they even have the chance to show their abilities. So that's what a fixed mindset is. And we want to push kids and encourage kids to have that growth mindset. And it takes time. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and give you some tools tonight to do so. The growth mindset is where their talents, abilities, and intelligence can be approved upon over time. So with time and effort and the right strategies, they will be able to um, improve those abilities, your intelligence, your talents. It's not a fixed thing that they, they will be able to grow and with practice get better at something. So I'm going to share just a quick video here. There are two types of mindset we can cultivate. One that embraces problems as opportunities to learn and one that avoids them, often out of fear to fail. People that avoid conflicts can be described as having a fixed mindset. Those who see problems as interesting challenges have a growth mindset. Sometimes we like to switch from one to the other. People have a fixed mindset because they believe that basic qualities like intelligence or talents are fixed traits and that these traits are responsible for success. They often like to document past achievements. With a growth mindset, people believe that new abilities can be developed through practice. This view creates the love for learning that most great leaders and artists have in common. For them, life becomes an exciting journey with endless opportunity to figure out new things and advance. To develop a growth mindset, Dr. Carol Dweck, the Stanford University professor who coined the term, advises leaders, teachers and parents to celebrate trying. Teachers should applaud students for any grade if they studied hard. Parents should encourage their children to develop any new skill they are interested in. Doing this will make them learn the skill of learning, which will also help them back in the classroom. To illustrate the difference in everyday life, let's observe two imaginary kids. Jay thinks you've either got it or you haven't. Anne knows that she can learn anything if she wants it enough. At physical exercise, Jay avoids challenges. When it's time to jump over the vaulting horse, he's afraid to look stupid and be laughed at. Anne embraces any challenge. It's exciting. It's fun. She knows that failing is part of learning, and if she tries hard, at the end, nobody will laugh at her. Jay avoids feedback. If the teacher tells him how to improve an assignment he has been working on, he takes it personally. Anne knows that to improve, she needs to listen to constructive criticism. She also understands that it's not her that is being assessed, but the results of her work on that one day. Jay always takes the easy road. For example, he likes escalators and hates to take the stairs. When he is practicing the guitar, he stops the moment he's getting stuck. Anne usually doesn't even take escalators. She jumps up the stairs, counts every step in her head, and enjoys feeling the blood rushing through her veins. She practices the drums every morning for 15 minutes. Not that she always enjoys it, but she knows that effort is part of a journey to a more fun life. Anne likes to see others succeed. It inspires her. She knows that if she motivates her friends to get better, she herself is likely to grow too. 
If his friends try new things and succeed, Jay feels threatened. He's afraid that their success will put pressure on him to do more with his life too. Modern companies look for employees with a growth mindset because they solve problems and persist despite obstacles. To spot the right ones, some ask during the interview whether the job applicant believes if managers are born or if management is a skill learned. Jay thinks that managers are born and gets the job. Neuroscientists support the idea. They confirm that the brain grows like any other muscle in the body with training. Studies show that adopted twins tend to have higher intelligence compared to their siblings who stayed with their biological parents. The difference appears to come from the higher educational levels of adopted parents and shows that nurture is more important than nature. A simple switch in how a person views a situation can mean the world of difference. Not just the outcome of that situation, the outcome of that person's place in life. As the late poet Samuel Beckett once said, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. What do you think about the concept? Is it overly simplistic? And if you buy the idea, do you believe it is possible to make a permanent switch from a fixed to a growth mindset? Please share your thoughts in the comment section below. So in the chat box, just real briefly, I hope that that was um, interesting, that you learned some things, but I want you to think about a question. What mistake have you or your child made that has taught you something? Because I know that you all have one, and don't feel like you have to chat it in the chat box, but even just reflect on um, a mistake that you or your child has made that has definitely taught you something and caused you to grow. We've all had those experiences, and I know that all of you can think about people that have a fixed growth mind, gro fixed mindset or a growth mindset. We all come across people in both of those categories every day, and to just be conscious of it and think about where do you want your students to be, your children um, to go. And so um, right now, I want to just share where, as they mentioned in the video, the idea of growth mindset comes from Carol Dweck. And this is one of her books. I'm sure she has many out there, um, very well known for this concept. So this might be a resource that you want to uh, read after hearing our presentation. Um, we also have many other resources that we'll be sharing with you, so you will get this link as well, um, as along with some others too. So why is a growth mindset important? Why do we need to help adults as well as kids change to that growth mindset? Our brain learns from challenges. As it mentioned in that video, um, it definitely learns from challenges. It will help our students confront challenges instead of shutting down or saying, I can't do this. We will give them some tools and ways to say, I can do this, I just can't do it yet. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, why is it important? They learn to view failure as a springboard for success. And I will, I just want to share one of the reasons it's really near and dear to my heart as I see my own children um, using these concepts from their teachers, some of their coaches even. And my youngest said to me one day, Mom, it's okay for me to make a mistake because that just means I'm learning. And it really caught me off guard of the way I was speaking to him. It was obviously, I was probably going, what did you do? Why did you do that? Like some of us do. And he really brought it back to the forefront for me. So um, they learn to use failure as a springboard. Um, they develop a passion for learning. They love to learn. Their, their mind keeps growing and growing. And 
they develop that passion to learn more. Uh, the gro having a growth mindset is strongly linked to happiness and achievement in life. And it equips them to tackle what life hands them. We all know that it's not always easy, whether it's life or school or whatever it might be. And having that growth mindset helps them to tackle whatever is put in front of them. So those are some reasons that we want to share with you some different um, ideas and th ways that you can utilize this within your classrooms at home and your life. Um, this is just a little bit of research, uh, the proof, I would say, of growth mindset. This is math grades before and after an inter intervention. And so you can take a look at this a little bit closer, but a little bit of the data that shows um, how it also affects their schoolwork and their grades and their GPA. So that is huge as well. Um, I'm not going to, we're not going to watch this video. I'm not going to pull this up, but this is another one that you will have access to when you receive the PowerPoint. So you can go ahead and watch it. It's a little bit longer, so we don't want to take the time tonight. So we have too much to share. Um, there will also be a four-week guide on how to teach growth mindset to kids, and it is a PDF, and it will give you some ideas and tips and actually kind of a lesson plan for you to implement with your students and your children at home. So you will have access to this as well in the PowerPoint, which I'm really excited, and please share with us as you are using them, because we'd love to hear how it's going. Last but not least, for me, um, we have some, there's always some misconceptions about growth mindset. And sometimes people will say, results don't matter. And according to, to Dweck, this is the most prevalent misunderstanding about growth mindset. Many equate it with praising kids solely for effort, regardless of whether or not they're learning. And the whole idea is to focus on the learning process. When you focus on their effort, you have to show how effort created learning, progress, of, or success. So it isn't just that results you know, don't matter. We are just looking at it in a different way. And the other one is the misconception that you have it or you don't, um, meaning growth mindset. And growth mindset is truly a spectrum. Um, even Dweck states that nobody has a growth mindset all the time. Everyone is typically a mixture of both, of the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And I personally think sometimes it's situational or whatever moment or experience you're in, whether you have that growth mindset or that fix. And it really takes a lot of work and practice to always have or to more often, I would say, have that growth mindset. So even those who work really hard to use a growth mindset daily still have moments that trigger a fixed mindset. So, but it's something just to be conscious of and continue to practice and even practice with your kids daily. So we are excited now uh, to share some tips, some tools with you. Um, and I'm going to let Mrs. Riley take it away. Thank you, Mrs. Logterman. So as Mrs. Logterman said, um, that was a lot of information, right? That was a lot of research. Um, that was a lot of just background on what a growth mindset is and the importance of it. But I know um, even as I look at that as an educator and also as a parent, you know, I can read all of that and it makes sense, but I also, the how, that was all of the what to me and why, but I want the how, right? And a lot of times um, it takes a minute to digest all of that and to think about how it applies specifically to your family and to your children. Um, but I want to just talk about some things that you can start doing right away 
because you're already doing them. And it just comes down to maybe making some small adjustments or even just being um, a little more conscious of the words that um, you're saying to your kiddos. So um, as the slide mentions, and I'll turn my camera off for this part, um, how, how do we turn all of this information into action and how can we do it right away with our kids? Um, and what, that, what I wanna focus on today is that idea of praise. And so this is something we all do with multiple individuals in our life and we'll narrow in specifically to our children and to our students. Um, Praise is big, right? And for a lot of us, myself included, it can be really automatic and really reflexive at times. You know, those common phrases like you're doing great and keep it up and that that fallback one, good job. I think we all use that frequently, right? And so if we just take a minute though to think about um, the praise that we're giving. So when we're giving it, how we're giving it, and really our intention and our meaning behind it, just those small pauses um, and those that conscious effort to just change things a little bit can have such a huge impact. So the ultimate goal of our praise when it comes to your child, academically and socially, really in any part, um, of their life is to encourage that intrinsic motivation, right? That is so big and it can be such a hard thing to teach, but ultimately we want our child to have that drive, to do well, to try their best. Um, that'll extend into so many aspects of our life. And it's, um, we sometimes, you know, don't give praise enough credit, but it can have such an impact on developing that characteristic of our for our child. So, Thinking about praise specifically, I want to talk about just three um, characteristics of praise that are really good things to be conscious of. And that's relating to praise being sparing, specific, and sincere. And we'll dig a little bit deeper into each of those um, characteristics of praise. Um, so we'll first think about praise being sparing, right? To, there is such thing as too much of a good thing, right? Um, I know for me, especially around Halloween time, that candy, there was definitely <laughs> too much of a good thing. And that can relate right back to praise as well. Um, it's crazy to think about it, but pr too much praise can have an adverse effect or a negative effect on your kiddo. It can lower the bar. It can lower the standard. Being overpraised for something might decrease their effort, right? If I'm getting praised for everything I'm doing, well, why would I go the extra mile tomorrow? Why would I put in any more if mom and dad are telling me that I'm doing awesome, right? So we have to really pick out those key times to give them that praise that they that they earn and they deserve, right? And too much of it, too much praise can can turn somebody into um, what I saw an article refer to as a praise junkie, someone that needs it all the time, right? They're, they're constantly looking for it, they're seeking it, and they need that praise in order to push forward and keep going. And we don't want that. That's external motivation that isn't always going to be there. So again, it relates back to developing that internal drive for them. Um, and for some kids, some can internalize a lot of praise into pressure. So it can translate to them into almost a fear of losing that praise, that comfort that they're getting from that praise. You know, if I'm getting all this praise when I'm doing well, well, what happens if I fail tomorrow? What happens if I do poorly on that next test? I'm not going to have that verbal affirmation parent or my home mentor, then what? How will I feel and how will I process that emotion? So Again, being really conscious of when you're giving that praise is so important and making sure that it is purposeful when you do provide it to your child. So, so important, but again, overusing it can have a lot of those effects that I just talked about. Um, thinking now onto how praise should be specific. So there are a lot of studies that have found that children, and I think we all can totally agree that our kids are smart and they are intuitive. and um, kids don't really put a lot of merit or belief in just these general blanket statements, as you can see there. Great job. Well done. Good job, right? They don't really feel the impact of that. In our head, we might be thinking, good job, as you did so awesome on that assignment, and I noticed X, Y, and Z, but if we aren't verbally giving them that feedback, they're not just going to dig that out of those simple statements. So 
it's definitely quicker to say good job. I think as parents, we sometimes find ourselves in that moment where we just have to be fast and we are we all have those moments where that's just how it has to be. But just think about what that's really communicating, right? So think instead about praising things like their perseverance or their organization or relate it to their to them as a person, praising their character or their kindness or their bravery, right? The more specific you are, they're going to hear that and they're going to relate that right back to, as Mrs. Logterman mentioned, that process and that effort. And that's really going to resonate with them a lot more than just those blanket statements. And finally, praise should be sincere. And that kind of goes hand in hand with being specific too. Again, our kids are smart, our kids are perceptive, and they can tell when we're just saying something to say it, right? If we don't really mean it, they know. Whether we think they do or not, they know. And so it's important to be super sincere and to mean what you are saying, right? Some studies have found that insincere praise for a child can translate into feeling like your parent is saying, I feel sorry for you, or I don't really understand you right now, things like that. And of course, that's not how we want our child to feel, right? Or they can think that the praise that we're giving them is kind of a band-aid. It's being used to cover up their moment of failure. We're kind of boosting their confidence when they know they did something wrong instead of addressing that and talking about it. So really offer that praise when it's earned. And that doesn't mean when they succeed fully, it's when they show you that effort or they made some kind of growth. And that way, if you're being purposeful in those moments, you can pull out exactly what you're praising them for. Don't put a Band-Aid on it. Instead, work on making those uncomfortable moments comfortable for them. It is life. It happens. They are going to fail. They are going to struggle. And we need to give them the tools and strategies to recognize those moments and to be able to persevere and work through them. <clears throat> super, super important. Um, that graphic there just talks about the difference between comparison praise and personal mastery praise. So again, making it sincere. Don't compare them to others in their class or other siblings, you know, putting a timestamp on it like they finish super fast. Make it personal to them. Compare their growth from the last time you checked in. Um, relate it to a goal that you set for them and how they're exceeding that or working toward it. Make it personal and sincere for your child because they will pick up on that. Um, another uh, kind of key component of praise and something to always think about is to praise the process, not the person. Neither form of praise is bad. It's just that praising the process can have a much stronger impact on your child. So person praise is ability oriented. So things like you are so smart. Um, you are a talented mathematician, or as you see on the graphic there, you're a talented painter. It comes natural to you, right? Sometimes those, those that type of praise is warranted, absolutely. But that process praise um, equates to that, that discussion we've had on praising effort and praising self-correction or praising the strategies that they've used. So you selected a great color combination or this new strategy you tried is working well. Again, neither person or process praise is a bad thing, but um, it's been found that that process praise really encourages your child to challenge themselves and to take risks, to make more of an effort, and to continue learning because learning is constant. So um, just tweaking your language a little bit can have such a strong um, impact on your child in that sense as well. Another um, kind of comparison uh, component to think about too is giving encouragement versus evaluation. So I love the comparison there as well. Evaluate praise. I like how clean your room looks. I like your persistence. That is your opinion, right? That is focusing on your judgment of their achievement versus focusing on what your child did. And it's so easy to do that, right? But that encouraging praise, your room looks great. You cleaned up all your toys. There's a process part of that, right? You didn't give up even when it was hard. It's not your judgment. It's not your personal opinion of what they did. It's you praising them for something that they can find tangible and something that they can recognize that they did on their own. So again, another way to just tweak your language to make it just that much more effective for your child when they, um, as they continue to grow um, their own growth mindset. 
It's also really, really important to set appropriate expectations. I think we can all agree that in the RVA, we have constant conversations about how no child um, is the same, even as the person sitting next to them, even as the older brother or the younger sister. Every child's level of proficiency and every child's, you know, a paper is going to look different. So it's important to really um, evaluate the expectations you have for your child and to make sure they are reasonable. They're not too low, they're not too high, and they're not just blanket expectations set for them because it worked for the sibling before them or the friend down the road, right? We have to relate it to where they're starting and where we want them to be and if that endpoint is attainable for them. Um, praise goes hand in hand in that, right? So don't just praise something because you feel like it's going to boost them, it's going to make them feel good. We should have to earn that praise. That's part of giving them that, that grit and that effort to continue on. But praising something for um, Susie, it might not be something you praise for Joe because that's too low of an expectation for him. So that, could, and, and I love this part because our home mentors know their children best. And I always fall back on my home mentors when I talk about these because you are your child's best advocate and you know them dearly. So um, recognizing those expectations and relating your praise to them can be so powerful as well. Now there all are alternatives, right? I just talked a ton about just how to, how to praise your child, how to do it, how not to do it, how often to do it, all of that stuff. But there's alternatives as well, right? We don't always have to give them those feel good phrases and that's okay because that's life as well, right? And sometimes these alternatives can be just as powerful. So the first one I have there um, is to say, thank you. This is such a simple phrase that can have so much weight. It can show your child that you noticed their efforts and that you appreciated them, right? How often are we thanking our kids for working so hard? right? That's really cool. And that would be something um, that I think we can relate to as adults in our work setting when our superior or our boss thanks us. I mean, at least for me, when I am thanked by Charlie, which it happens all the time, we are so, so lucky for that. It is a boost for me and it makes me want to work that much harder. So um, that can be super powerful for our kids as well. Um, acknowledge their goals. I always encourage goal setting with um, my families, especially with families with older children that can really have those conversations. Start the year or start tomorrow by just talking about where they're at and where they want to be and acknowledge that too. Ask them about their personal goals, right? Instead of us just setting that for them, get their opinion on it and involve them in the process. And then center your future praise on those goals. They can relate right back to that first conversation. Maybe you even post those goals for them to see in your learning space. And that way they can relate to them and they can even track their own growth in that sense as well. Um, asking questions. So let your child be the teacher. When it comes down to evaluating their assignment, start with some questions. Ask them, what was your favorite part of that drawing that you did? Or what did this, what part of this project was the most challenging for you? Or what did you enjoy most? Sometimes you gain so much insight from just asking them to share instead of just praising them and moving forward. And just in those conversations, they feel as though they're the expert, you're giving that room to teach, to have them teach you about what they did. And that can be such a powerful moment for them as well. And finally, at least for me, being the talker that I am, this is the one <laughs> that I forget about the most often. Say nothing, right? Which sounds the opposite of what I've been talking about. What do you mean, Mrs. Riley? We're supposed to phrase things appropriately and, and give them all these words to boost it. But sometimes it's really okay to just let things be, right? It's definitely easier said than done, especially for me. But kids don't really need to be praised all the time. And that goes right back to just being sparing with it. Find a balance, sometimes just a smile or a nod or some kind of silent affirmation for them is enough. So. Um, again, being sparing and finding that balance and sometimes saying nothing at all can be just as powerful. Um, so we're going to talk briefly before I wrap up about just rephrasing feedback. So changing inactive feedback to effective feedback. This is not always possible. Again, life happens and we get in a rush, but if we can be conscious of this at times, it can be super, super helpful. 
So I'm going to do a little pulse check because I've been talking quite a bit. <laughs> so I invite you all to think about this and even share some responses in the chat box if you'd like to. So one example of maybe an ineffective form of feedback. You are an awesome reader, right? Not super specific, not really focused on a process. It's definitely um, person related. It's, and it's also my opinion. I think you're an awesome reader, right? So how could you change this to reflect a growth mindset approach? How could you add in something or just change it fully to be a little bit more powerful? You met your reading goal today. Awesome. I like how you read that. Yes, that focuses on something they specifically read. You pronounced almost all of the words correctly. Yes, that is amazing. I noticed that you used some strategies on your own when you got to a tough word. Absolutely. You read the words with a great flow. Oh, you guys, this is amazing. It was very reflective how you noticed the character's emotion by what you read. Wow, Shelly, that's so powerful. And you read that expressively. Okay, our parents are the best. You truly are. That's amazing. Yes, those blew my examples out of the water. I came prepared in case I heard crickets, but those don't even read mine. Those were so much better. I noticed you tried your best. Did you find that book challenging? Why or why not? You use so much expression in your reading voice. Well done. All of those things. See how those are so, even just reading them. I had a much bigger smile on my face because it just is so much more specific <clears throat> and so much more powerful and conveys that effort or that strategy that you noticed and appreciated. So absolutely. Um, as we near the end of my part here, I just want to wrap up and just talk a little bit about feedback as well and just the statements and rephrasing things a bit more um, and just really convey to you that your statements and your affirmations for your children can really encourage their growth mindset and your focus to the things your child can do and help them to view failure as a discovery of another way that does not work. That is life, that happens. We should not have a fear of failure. I always think of my children who are one in three and I am just blown away at the bravery and the risk taking that comes with that age. They have no fear. They will try anything, whether it makes them crack their head open <laughs> or not, but truly they just have that innate drive to just test out something and it just it translates so much into how I hope to encourage my students to be as well. Make it clear that when something is challenging it's because your brain is growing stronger and have those conversations with your child. It's so so powerful. Um, definitely too we already someone already mentioned that power of the word yet right learning takes time learning means to give yourself grace and to uh, tackle those obstacles as they come convey to your child that they can do hard things and they can learn anything they truly truly can it might not happen overnight it might not happen this year but with effort and with drive and with that that self-seeking and internal motivation, they truly, truly can. And it's important for us to make sure that they know that we believe that about them as well. Um, so finally, of course, negative self-talk is going to happen, right? We can all think of those moments probably where we ourselves or our children have spoken negatively about themselves in some way. And sometimes it causes us to pause, right? How do we address that with them? How do we effectively help them shift um, yes, Trisha, how do we help them shift to um, recognizing that feeling and moving past it? And I love this quote um, that when little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it is our job to share our calm, not to join their chaos. Give them that safe place, right? Help them shift from what they are focusing on, um, shift from focusing on what they can't do to what they are capable of doing right? Validate their feelings. It is so important. Name that feeling with them. Make them feel like you hear it because it is so real for them. Even if we think it's minimal for that fifth grader, that is a big emotion and it is important for them to know that we are their safe place to talk about it. Discuss that negative talk. Relate to them. Discuss how that impacted your life previously. Give them an example of um, a time where you spoke negatively in the same way or had a failure and make them see you as human also and then help them to move on. That orange um, bullet point there is a direct link to an article 
that talks about seven ways to address negative self-talk with your child. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. A lot of really great tips to help them. Never underestimate the power of yet. Mastery and understanding it all takes time. And that word yet, as I mentioned, can help provide grace and the gift of time and the positivity to keep trying. There's definitely a difference between not knowing and not knowing yet. So instead of saying, I can't do this, I can't do this yet. I am not good at this yet. My plan did not work yet. I don't understand yet. And I don't know yet. Just that one word at the end of those statements can be so powerful and convey all that we're talking about tonight, which is that understanding that our brain is a muscle, it is growing, and it is so important to have that internal drive to keep going forward and for us to be the supports along the way. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Mrs. Boren. She is going to be sharing with you. We've touched a little bit about resources already, but she has just a plethora of more that will be so, so powerful for you all. So I will turn it over to Mrs. Boren. All right, let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, as you can see by my screen, or maybe you just saw it, um, I have lots of tabs open because that is how many resources we have to share with you today. Um, like Mrs. Riley said, a lot of times we love to hear the what, the why, but then, you know, how is having things that you can take away and implement right away. Um, whenever we uh, or see some someone speak on a topic, we want to know what we can use immediately. So that is what I am here to share with you right away, even tomorrow, if you'd like, is to just sit down with your kids. Think about the things that they might often say. Um, there are some examples on the left. I made a mistake. I just can't do math. This is too hard. I give up. These are things that we hear a lot from our children. And you can jot some of those down on a piece of paper or a whiteboard, something that you have at home, and then brainstorm with your child how to switch that. How can you change that thinking into something a little bit more positive? Um, maybe just simply adding the word yet to that statement can make it so much more powerful. Um, and, you know, hanging that up, keeping that displayed where you can often revisit. Maybe there's a certain subject where you just, you have a harder time with it every day, but you need to kind of focus on the growth behind it, how you can do it. It just, it's going to take time, it's going to take grit, and it's going to take determination. Just because it's hard today doesn't mean it's going to be hard tomorrow. So having that covered about the things that are hard, um, using your life to model some of those things, share things that were hard for you. Um, I think of lots of examples in my life, and I've shared a lot with my students in the past too. Um, I would always tell them, especially when I taught in building, I would share, you know, I was never the smart kid in my class, you know, according to test scores and all of those things that we receive, gotta love that part of education. Um, but the difference that I always felt was that I, I would work hard. I could, I could put in the effort and I knew if I put the effort in, I could maybe do it. And there is a big shift when, when kids think that way, when they know it's possible. Um, so having that conversation and showing them examples where they can apply that in their lives is huge. Um, another great resource um, is this um, bulletin board you can see displayed. Um, when you click on some of these pictures, they will open up into files. I'm going to just kind of share with you right away what some of them look like. Um, these are ones you can very easily print off. There are some that reflect more of that fixed mindset, whereas others reflect that growth mindset. Um, and you can use some of these. Pick out the ones that kind of resonate with you that you could hang up at home and decorate them. Make them look like something you want to use more often. Um, the more you see something, the more you use it. So you can print these off. You can make your own. Um, we have all kinds of them attached here. Another wonderful resource, and I kind of smile and smirk, um, is this set of posters. And this is actually something that one of our famous teachers made, Mrs. O'Connor. She's here tonight. <laughs> she um, actually hand lettered these. Um, they are wonderful. They are ones that you could color or 
paint, whatever you'd like to do with them, but they have a little bit of a fancy lettering to them, which are really fun. Um, so go ahead, print some of those off, decorate your homeschool area, um, wherever it is the child's working during the day, you can use these. Um, again, pick the one that really, really fits your child or let your child pick the one that they love. Um, but there's so many in here. I mean, you're, you'll probably end up with way more <laughs> than you could possibly ever use. Um, but they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So thank you, Mrs. O'Connor, for sharing those with us. Um, the next resource I'd like to share, um, and you've probably seen a lot of this tonight, are some daily affirmations. And let me see if I can pull up the right one here for this. Um, you've seen this website, biglifejournal.com, on a lot of our slides. Um, great question, Kelly. We are going to be sharing these slides out with all of you um, after tonight. So you will be able to click on these pictures and open up any of these files that you would like. Um, so everything will be accessible to you. I'm just kind of walking you through them right now. This website, biglifejournal.com, has a, about a million um, different, different tools, different resources. Um, so they are absolutely wonderful. Um, one of the resources that they have is a little guide on ways to give your child affirmations. Um, and this is something that you can print off again if you like. If this helps you, you could hang it on your refrigerator at home. I know that oftentimes is a hub for families, a great reminder. Um, you could hang it up in, you know, on your mirror, in your bathroom, wherever you look daily to just kind of remind yourself of these things. Um, these are great, great tips for your child and for you. Um, affirming your child every morning, creating an affirmation board. Um, affirmations on the mirror sing your way into a better mood and better health. So all kinds of different tips are on here. So that is linked as well. And um, we talked about the power of yet. Um, this is a wonderful video that we've also linked. Um, when you click on it, this video will open in a new tab um, or you can watch it right in the slides. Um, this is a great video that you can share with your child about the power of yet. Um, you know, we've talked about it from more of an adult standpoint here tonight, but a lot of times kids need to um, have this information shared in another way. So this is a great, great video for some of our younger students on the power of yet, how they can change their mindset, how they can add that word yet into their thoughts and ideas and really um, grow with that. And then we kind of have a, a few other resources here as well. Yes, I know some kids just really benefit from videos. So that's, it's so to see when they can be more of that visual learner and see everything come together in a different way. Um, this other resource is something that I just wanted to share as, from a teaching standpoint. Um, this was a picture of something that I had done with one of my students um, back in brick and mortar. Um, what I would oftentimes do, especially for my younger students, when they can't see their growth necessarily, and I can see it, I try to make it visual for them. And you can do this with just about any skill. Um, I like to always graphs with them so they could see, oh yeah, I have learned something more since the beginning of the year. This um, graph in particular showcased counting. So we started out by um, writing down how high the child could count at the beginning of the year. And we set little mini goals along the way. You can see the goal of 70 at one point. And then that child could see that he had surpassed that goal. And the ultimate goal was to get to 100. But he could see that growth happening. I could hear it all the time. But for him to see it and to, to really take in the fact that I knew he was growing was hard unless I could visually represent it. And this can be done with letters, with with scores, with vocabulary, with fluency, um, just about anything can be turned into some kind of a graph. Um, so think about what it is that your child might be struggling with or what's hard for them. How can you change that into a visual representation to show them that they are growing from day to day? Um, it doesn't have to be every single day, but little check-ins. You know, we would go back to counting um, every few weeks. You know, 
in, in the in-between points, this child needed more to just practice and to just work hard. Um, but then when we would gather ourselves again, we would talk about it. We would, we would um, celebrate the growth that we saw. Even if it was little, it was still worth celebrating. So you could certainly try this um, too. This slide in particular does not have, excuse me, a um, graph that you can manipulate, but this is something very easy to create, and you can always check in with your child's teacher or create it on your own as well. Um, the next slide, yeah, Pinterest is always a great tool, absolutely, Trisha. Um, the next slide is, and I'm going to kind of escape out of here, um, a growth mindset bookmark. Um, just kind of a fun activity. Maybe you have a child that loves to read or is very artsy. Um, this is another tool that we found from Big Life Journal. Um, and it has a step-by-step -step tool and guide on how to make these bookmarks that you see represented. Um, these are great easy visual reminders that you can have right inside your child's book every day. Um, you know, opening up their book and seeing this every day, having them read it out loud to you, this is a great way to start your day. Um, and you can use these other pieces too that kind of go along with it. So another awesome tool. Weave these into your day in whatever way works for you. I'm so glad some of you are feeling like these are going to work well for you. Great to hear. Oh, let me scooch down here. Um, the next one is a positivity box, also another resource. Um, this is a box that you can create out of just something simple you have at home, like a Kleenex box or any other box you have. You can decorate it. Um, and then inside, you can put little slips of paper writing positive thoughts, things that have gone well, successes that you have had. Um, this would work very, very for just about any student of any age. You could model this. You could do this as a family. Um, just another way to really practice all of those things. Um, and there's even some little words that you can print out. Um, if, if you're not super creative, they're all right here for you. Um, so you can certainly use these to decorate that box as well, or just do it in whatever way you'd like. Um, but here are some little takes that you can add to it as well. So another great tool. Yes, thank you so much for sharing, Mrs. O'Connor. That's an awesome, awesome addition. Um, things invented by mistake. Um, we talked earlier about some famous um, people, J.K. Rowling and um, Mr. Hershey. And those are great examples to just share with students to, to show them that even some of the most famous people we know um, have really grown because of their mistakes. They didn't give up. Um, if they had given up, we wouldn't have a lot of the things we have today. Um, but they, they didn't give up. They said, just not yet. Things are going to happen. And a lot of these um, inventions are actually ones that came about from a mistake or from not getting it right the first time or by accident. Um, so you can read through some of these. You could do some research with your child on these different instances and then, you know, really relate that to what's happening with your child at home. Um, you know, yes, reading might be hard, but remember what we read about with the inventor of Velcro. <laughs> maybe that's a stretch, but maybe chocolate chip cookies. You know, this is so great to see. And a lot of these you know, we didn't even know about. We didn't realize that there were failures before. Um, sometimes it takes, you know, doing a little research to find out where something actually came from and, and how a person got to where they are. Awesome, awesome quotes. Yes, absolutely. Let's go back here for a second. Um, the next resource, if, you're, if your child is more of an auditory learner, are some songs. Um, there is a whole list of different songs that you can use with your child. And you don't have to necessarily buy things, but they have um, different tracks that you can listen to um, right away. You know, with, of a, as a parent of children that are five and three, um, I see Sing, I see Trolls, The Lion King. Those are all movies my kids know well. Um, but there are other examples here too that might really resonate with your child. Um, but listening to just 
powerful music and really thinking about the lyrics and how those people have grown or those characters in those movies or whatever it's from, um, that can also be very uplifting for your child. Um, so think about that too as a resource. Yes, a lot of us really just benefit from listening to great music. Um, so definitely check these out as well. And next but not least, um, we also have some readouts that you can check into. Um, a lot of families ask, you know, about books they can read with their children. And even if you have some older students, don't be discouraged. Um, don't think that you can't read a picture book together. Um, we can still learn a lot of really powerful lessons by reading books like this with our children. And you could even look them up on YouTube, things like that. But if you go ahead and open this up, you can click on any of these titles and listen to them. Um, these are some really great ones. I know um, my daughter just um, recently did something really fun at school with only one U. Um, there's just great examples. Beautiful Oops is another one I've loved. It talks about a, a child that makes a mistake and it turns into something even greater. Um, so definitely check some of these out. And along with that are another list of books. Again, like I said, we have so many things here. We don't mean to overwhelm, but everyone uses resources differently. Um, you know, I'm hoping that by seeing all of these, you will have a handful of things that you can do tomorrow or next week or whenever you are ready. Um, this is another great list of books that you can access. Um, it even breaks it down kind of by age level and which ones would really work well for different ages. So definitely check out um, another great link in the PowerPoint. And one of my personal favorites, especially for younger students, are what are called Class Dojo videos. Um, now, if you're not familiar with Class Dojo, um, it's a website that is oftentimes used in the classroom. Um, and it's, it's a website where um, teachers and parents can really help students with um, learning different behaviors and um, teaching them how to grow. Um, and within that website, there are lots of great videos for students, especially younger ones. Um, these videos talk about, you know, how to use the brain, how the brain is a muscle, um, how when you continue to work your brain, you can do extraordinary things. Um, however, if you just kind of go with the flow and let everything be easy, you're not working your brain as much. Um, so having kids really understand that and see some of these videos are super helpful. Um, I'm going to open this up just so you can see. This was one example. Your brain is like a muscle. Um, if you can't open the video, there is a little link. I know it's a little bit hard to see right now, but it says try this if video is not working. That's personally what I had to do. Um, but there's many videos that you can go through with Class Dojo. Another one is Power of Yet. We talked about that. So this would be yet another one that you can use. Um, the Magic of Mistakes. Um, the mysterious world of neurons. So they talk a little bit more in detail about the brain and how it works, how it forms connections um, by all the things that you practice and do each day. Um, so when your child really starts to understand, you know, how the brain works, how it is within their control to do things, the more they use their brain and practice, um, they start to open their mind a little bit to having things be a little bit harder. And this next slide just kind of shows you how to open up that. There are little um, resources that go with the videos too, take home questions and things that you can talk about with your child. And then I know we're getting short on time, so I'm gonna kind of whip through these last few. Um, we also have some other videos that you can access on um, YouTube channels. Um, again, all you have to do is click the picture to open up this resource. Um, Mrs. Logterman at the beginning of the presentation shared a talk. Um, if you have not watched those before, they are amazing. Um, there's so many out there that are just so motivating and inspiring, um, but that would be a great channel to watch um, amongst all of these others as well. So definitely look at that. A few more movies you could view with your, ch your children, your kids. Um, these are all great ones listed here, and they open up into a whole nother list of great videos. And last but not least, 
Um, if you liked a lot of these resources that we found from Big Life Journal, you can actually subscribe um, to a freebie every Friday. I actually just recently did this because I didn't know that it was something that I could do. So you can enter for that and they will send you freebies to print off. Um, yes, Mrs. Lochterman had a ton that she shared um, with Mrs. Riley and I, and I think Mrs. Riley did too. So this was something new to me and maybe it's new to you as well. But that's something you can also check out if it's something you want to continually, you know, bring your mind back to to keep that fresh and um, rejuvenated in your daily teaching with your child. And as we wrap things up um, and close, what I'd love to ask all of you is, you know, what is your biggest takeaway from tonight? What's something that you feel really hit home for you? Um, I know for me, even preparing for this presentation, there were things that I'm like, yeah, I could do better in that area. I could definitely grow. Um, you know, for me, it was thinking more about um, the mastery praise, um, that personal mastery praise, how I can work that in more so with my students. So go ahead and share in the chat box how we use praise and how to Yes. Oh my goodness. Look at all of you. <laughs> I can't even keep up with all of the comments. This is great. Um, let me just kind of shift over here. Yet. Um, how we use praise and how to more effectively effectively give it. What a great night. Thank you for teaching me. Oh, awesome. Um, make the uncomfortable comfortable. Embrace failure. A fixed mindset can limit a gifted student. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, oh, I love the RVH. Shelly, thank you. That's so sweet of you to say you feel empowered by these resources. Awesome. That's That was our goal for tonight, to feel like you could walk away with something. Um, all the resources, the power of yet, how to help your child take on challenges that are tough to them and have a growth mindset when figuring out how to meet the challenge. Absolutely. Fantastic. Oh, you guys have such great things to share. Wonderful. Well, with that, um, but we want to thank you so much for attending tonight. We know this takes time out of your evening, um, but thank you so much. Um, we hope that you are able to use a lot of the things we've shared tonight, um, and we hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you for all that you do for your kids and for being a part of the RBA.